Hello, everyone. Welcome to the fourth discussion in our uh, reading group for SF Masterworks. We are reading the books that Golangs published as SF Masterworks in the order that they were published as Masterworks, not in their original publication order. And we're typically reading about one book a month, uh, except in the case of today's book, which uh, is 600 pages long. So we divided it up over two months. We had the first discussion about Cities in Flight by James Plish last month. It's posted on both uh, Jared and my channels. And um, today's discussion is for the second part of Cities in Flight, which covers Earthman Come Home and... Something with the word of, time in it. Triumph, triumph of time. Yeah. The triumph of time. Yeah. Triumph of time. Uh, so, yeah, we'll be <laughs> discussing both of those. I have only read up to three quarters of the way through Earthman Come Home. Uh, Chris and Jared have fortunately read the other book as well. And also, Chris, since you weren't here last time, uh, I'd love to hear what you thought of the first two books. So, okay. uh, <laughs> uh, Jared, would you like to start us off sure. with introductions? <laughs> uh, I'm Jared. I run the Fantasy Thinker YouTube channel. And um, Vasher, if you would have seen my review, non-spoiler, on the, these two last books, you would have seen that I told you to skip book three and move on to book four. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, Chris, how are you? <laughs> Yeah, so my name's Chris Mullen. I sometimes make YouTube channels, I sometimes make YouTube channels, YouTube videos about books and movies. And this is my second time reading Cities of Flight. Uh, and I hadn't mentioned just before we started this book that I DNF book three the first time. And Cities of Flight is literally the only book in my entire life that I have ever DNF'd. Okay. Wow. <laughs> and okay. let me tell you, if I hadn't seen Jared's video. I would have DNF'd it for a second time. <laughs> but thankfully, oh. <laughs> I took his advice, parked book three at the point that I did, and started book four. And while book four is still dross, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it, as you quite rightly say, like, I probably wouldn't have finished it if I had, if you hadn't said, like, the end of the book at least has some things to discuss and it has some things to talk about and i think that's my main takeaway from the book is this is a crap load of good ideas that were sort of very poorly executed in my view or certainly not what i wanted out of the, the ideas let's put it that way yeah that's yeah. fair yeah <clears throat> yeah i think i think i agree with you i wrote down as many uh nice things about the ideas nothing about the characters uh or the story as I did angry notes about how the characters were all dealing with each other. <laughs> so... <laughs> yeah, oh, book four will infuriate you for that. Oh, oh my really? god, yeah, oh, it's yeah. it's it's the worst for the I would say the inter character relationships, but we'll get on to that, I think. Mm -hmm. in some ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I thought Mayor Amalfi was insufferable, and that was like 90% of the reason why I. It took me a long... I, I don't DNF like I was telling Chris and Jared earlier. I don't DNF, so I will finish this book. I just... And, and I was good about it this time. I usually start my reading for these discussions like a couple of days before. This time I started two weeks ahead and I still <laughs> couldn't... I couldn't finish it because it just went too slow for me. Um, But yeah, I... Uh, what was I saying? I, I didn't like Mayor Amalfi's character. I didn't like i i think it's a certain genre of fiction perhaps like you know those james bond style books where one person does everything without telling anyone and you know they're keeping the audience in suspense but also everybody else for some reason why uh but <coughs> i thought i haven't read any of those books i just sort of assumed that this might have been acceptable <laughs> as a style of storytelling for that reason but yeah. What? What? What did yeah, you that, all that think? That was that was a question of mine too. Is like, why is this guy who's in charge of a city that flies in doing everything? Like, there's no delegation except for a few cases with his right hand man there, mm -hmm. and it's just like it's so that in itself was unrealistic, mm -hmm. and you know, just it it just 
chalked it up to i think the the author didn't seem to want to bother with other characters Mm -hmm. he just wanted to tell his put his thoughts and ideas on paper and just do it through the one character and that's it Mm -hmm. and he did it and uh and and i think chris brought this not chris uh somebody brought this up in the last discussion that these these this book especially was serialized originally Mm -hmm. in a magazine Mm -hmm. and uh, and so these uh, the little the chapters in the third book are episodic, and they um, they have like just a little like a little beginning and a little end, um, and it's so explanatory. Like the your your main guy Amalfi there, he just sits there and explains a story for each story. Yeah. And and he does it through dialogue half the time, which is infuriating because it could be, it could have been an action thing that was yeah. happening, but it yeah. wasn't happening. It was him just explaining it. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, it was interesting because especially when I got to the end of book four, when I was really at the end of my tether, and I decided to go back and find some synopsis of the book. Right, you know, just for what happened in book four. Because it, there, there's no propulsion through the right, and I think that's the bit. I think that, and that's where it comes from the serialized nature is the fact that you're not needing people to be on the next chapter, if you know what I mean. Mm. Probably because of how it was published, published all the time. So you've got a chunk of story somewhere in the chapter, tiny bit, mm. and then you get a lot of techno babble for a lot of it, and very little of the language because it was consistent from chapter to chapter. They would introduce new terms all the time that was almost impossible to follow. But when you read the synopsis of book four, it sounds like classic, exciting space opera because of the things that essentially they were doing. I mean, it's that kind of end of the world kind of, you know, story that yeah. the last book, you know, it, 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 and what are they going to do to stop the end of the world? They kind of explain it in science. That could have been a really exciting rivet novel, but actually what I was reading does not match the synopsis, if you know what I mean. There's, there's a kind of like stakes and all this yeah. kind of stuff that's happening. and, yeah. and like on that high level kind of questions about relationships and relationships and about how age and how icky that all that kind of stuff but actually what i was reading mm-hmm. like yeah. i got none of that at the time and it was like why that doesn't make sense yeah. you know time was ending and they basically just had a boardroom meeting about it <laughs> <laughs> that's what it was <laughs> Like, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I mentioned that I got spoiled ish for the fourth book because I read the introduction, right? What I read there, and you guys tell me if this is what happens, is that Amalfi seeds himself as the beginning of the next universe. That and after reading the third book, I'm like, I, I don't want <laughs> that universe to exist. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> I'd rather everything yeah. just ended. Well, it wasn't just him, though. There was okay. other. There are other people, and I think, and I think, it, in uh, Blitch's prose is wandering, so mm. it's not always hard to nail down exactly what he was uh, plot-wise coming out with. But I think each person involved at the end was going to have their own universe as well oh. um i think Interesting. and so it wasn't just El Ma- like i said in the, in the fourth book he he actually did introduce a few more characters mm-hmm. that made it a little more interesting so you didn't mm-hmm. have to always go through amalfi's head um, <laughs> but uh which you're right he was quite unbearable <laughs> at, oh, at <yeah>. times <laughs> and uh so but i, I you know, and there's there's a lot more I had to say about that last chapter <laughs> yeah. uh, once once we get there. But uh, as far as book three goes, um, yeah, in my review I said it was skippable because you can just read book four and get what he was yeah. getting at without mm. knowing all the stuff in between because it was like I said it was serialized previously and it was meant to stand alone. And I know. Mm for the collection blish supposedly went back and rewrote some stuff in order to like try to blend it but i i don't think it worked and so book four stands on its own as its own thing 
And um, at least in book four, you get a few more characters, especially towards the end, uh, where um, you have different characters uh, sitting around the board 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 table, uh, <laughs> having a meeting about the end of time, and uh, trying to think about what to do about it. Um, and it was funny that ultimately they really couldn't do anything about it, hmm. other than have a situation set where they may have some little influence on the next universe. Hmm. Uh, so the, yeah. not much action. <laughs> I, I, I do think it's interesting when you think about the order that these books were written and published, though, because three mm. was the first. Yeah. Three was number first. And I think if I had read three first, I might have been a bit for, more forgiven of it, if you know what I mean, because in its own right, you know, I don't know about how the world has been set up and all of that kind of stuff that we knew about from reading books one and two and the, the stories, the prequels mm. that kind of went into it that kind of made book three feel redundant a bit like you're saying, you know, in, in mm. a lot of ways. And especially when you put book four in the end, like the outcome of it, like it is very much what I read of it of a mouthy showing that he's smarter than everybody else or that that's the, kind, and you don't, you're not rooting for him at the start. So <laughs> he's just <laughs> smug and a bit self-important and all, he's all the worst characteristics of humanity in a lot of ways, especially male yeah. characters. Like my God, <clears throat> He's, 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 he's insufferable to, to, to oh, read yeah. about. Um, whereas at least some of the other stories, you kind of got a bit more, few more interesting characters, people that you could root for, people that you kind of were in peril or, you know, that kind of stuff rather than this mm -hmm. kind of thing of humanity's in peril. And I think even yeah. at the stage, I never actually really cared whether the universe ended or not. Mm. You yeah. know, it uh, kind of didn't matter. And I think could, they'd given up as well. Couldn't wait. <laughs> 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 so how did they take living through that long assuming it happens in the distant future how did they because one of my gripes with earth man come home is we didn't address the fact that this guy's been living for a millennium like there was one brief sentence about oh uh do you know what it's like to make daily decisions uh, as a mayor of the city quickly followed up with oh i'm also in love with d and what okay we'll talk about that but um they didn't address this and i think a lot of it is because we got the entire story through amalfi's eyes none of like what are what is the rest of the city doing how are they mm -hmm. living through this and as far as i can tell they have immortality but basically what they're doing with the immortality is the daily drudgery that people want to escape and do other things with their life with so so why would this entire city of people want to live like that for a millennium and like those are interesting questions that i think could have been explored but weren't um i i think it's supposed maybe it's just a meant to be a bunch of like action sequences with like you know big maneuvers like moving planets and things like that maybe it's not meant to be a uh, thought provoking um uh, story story but yeah uh what was my point yeah it, they didn't address <laughs> the aging thing at all so i was curious because i haven't read the fourth book if that comes up at all and how it's handled yeah he he keeps saying that um it comes up a couple times where they had to in book three where they had to um try and get resources for that plant where they could manufacture the drug that made them uh not age mm -hmm. um but it is a consistent throwaway line like yep we, we don't age now and mm. and they just keep going you know um and yeah you're right they don't it doesn't get addressed that well as far as that goes but other than the fact that they were able to survive until the end of time mm. Uh, and so in the fourth book, it does get brought up that maybe Amalfi's too old to be doing this anymore. And mm. he, he gives up his mayorship. Um, sorry to spoil it for you. Oh, I, know. No, no, I know you're on the edge of your seat. But he does give up his mayorship at one point to try to move on to something else. Um, mm -hmm. so it does at least get brought up in that manner. It's, but it's, it's, it's not 
there's nothing in depth about it. It, mm. it doesn't. It does. He doesn't delve into any of that stuff. Um, Got it. In a philosophical manner, other than just mentioning it, you know. Mm. I think it's, this is going to be fascinating because obviously we've had two books, Forever War and uh, I'm Legend, and I think both really investigate the kind of nuts and bolts of what the book's about. You know, what, what the impetus was to make it about. The Forever War is this kind of idea. If you were fighting a war over a long time and you were away from home a long time, what would that be like when you come back? Mm. All of those kind of things. Yeah. They really go into, right, yep. here I'm going to propose some end game scenarios for you here of actually what would happen so that it's philosophically interesting. Am Legend does the same kind of in isolation and all does all that stuff. And here, in the first couple of chapters of each book, he lays the groundwork for what could be really fascinating kind of exploration into this. Even in book four, when he kind of throws this whole situation with D back in the thing of, right, if you live for a millennia, mm. does the concept of a relationship completely and utterly just rip apart and throw in its head? Because most of us live for a certain period of time, get married, 20s, 30s, 40s, whatever, and kind of have a lifespan that we will, in theory, have one life partner for, and at the end of it, you, you lose, you'll have a quality number of years together, but ultimately, you'll go into old age together. But if you don't age, mm. surely the whole concept of relationship totally breaks down. I couldn't tell you how frustrated I was that it came down to this, essentially, a, a bit power imbalance between him and D. You know, D was in a sort of loveless relationship that had been going on for hundreds of years like at what point do you go yeah oh yeah no it it, it wasn't in you're right it wasn't explored it just wasn't explored at all it was just like yeah yeah there we love each other and i love her and uh you know for a while i think d went with him for a little while and then that was it <laughs> but then she just, stays with with her husband. Like the whole thing is. Yeah, just... And at the end, she stays with, with her original. Uh, what was the guy's name? I can't. Mark remember Mark Hazelton? Mark, Mark yeah. Hazelton, yeah. Hazelton. Yeah, yeah. 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 And uh, <laughs> and she stays with him at the end of the universe. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> hopefully, she got her own universe afterwards. But <laughs> <laughs> did she? What was the character like in book four? Uh, because in this one, she was the dumb dumb oh, yeah. person that got everything explained to oh, and that was that was painful <laughs> and then the scene with the king where he's like yeah he's going to take d and like neither like she doesn't get a say in that and mark is not mm. upset by it other than the fact that yeah what's up with using women as bait in this book like he did that even on the planet of he or her or however that's pronounced <laughs> and, he uh, Oh, hey. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, yeah, it, it's, uh, we, yeah, it, I mean, that, that is a sign of the times that this was written. Um, and I guess this is your classic example right mm. here of, um, a, uh, what do you, what do you want to say it? limited worldview when it came to uh male female relations mm. um and uh it, it, yeah it killed me especially when when he uh was a line he said i wish i wish you knew your history yeah <laughs> and then he goes on to explain the history for another two paragraphs and then <laughs> and then her husband hazelton's like yep you're right <laughs> you <Yeah>. know <laughs> and I'm just like uh oh. This is horrible. The dialogue it, it, was so bad. Oh yeah. <laughs> in, in theory, this is the worst of human of masculinity because it is mansplaining for six hundred yeah, pages. Absolutely. Like that is that is completely yeah. what the book is is something to do. But that's like I've got to be fair about it. None of the characters are well written. Like yeah. this is not a character based story at all. No, right. there's, no. there's nothing about it. As you say, the dialogue. I mean, I just kept on coming away with it. You set up this kind of like interesting enough construct of ideas and science and then you have a soap opera plays out you know in terms of like each chapter like the dialogue yeah. is that level of interaction there's yeah. only like petty bits that actually happen and then we move on to the next chapter and in a slightly yeah. different scenario slightly different place and things and move forward maybe 30 years and mm -hmm. here's where we are and you're getting like another bit it feels serialized in that way and i think that yeah. that ultimately while 
we're going to continue to bash on this in a lot of different ways. I think it is a product of how it was published in, in a lot of mm. ways. And I'm sure it worked at the time in that form when you were kind of, give me another bit of that world or mm. what happened in that world or the science of that world, because that's what people would have been into. But as a cohesive novel, it's not good. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I agree. I did find, like, even I tried to read it like that. Like, so I tried not yeah. to have issue with the fact that like overall um the story wasn't that interesting that there was no overarching sequence that we could i guess follow but um there's i had issues within each story for instance uh with the planet of her like just taking it out of axis it did that pretty in a pretty cavalier fashion, right? Like taking these decisions that affect an entire planet. And sure, let's say that's a certain genre or style of storytelling in which like there's a dude who comes and saves everyone. Okay, cool. But then what about the consistency? He, They had a broken spin dizzy. And uh, as far as I can tell, you need a spin dizzy running to, set, to have the field going, right? So once they separated from the planet uh, Amalfi claims that the spindizy screen of the planet will make it so the atmosphere doesn't e escape and they'll still have heat cool I'll buy that but where the hell did they get that spindizy from and if they were able to manufacture a new one why didn't they repair their own so mm. they, it just <laughs> had a lot of like it felt yeah. like there were a lot of inconsistencies within the story each story as well that yeah, I found it difficult to <laughs> read, but yeah, did you guys notice that? Yeah, well, I think or... in some cases he mentions that there's more than one spin dizzy working at a time to mm -hmm. fly the city. So I'm not sure. Because you're right, he didn't explain it very well, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure if it was just one of the machines that was wasn't working at a time, and eventually that would break down other machines because i guess you might need a whole yeah you might need all of them to you know to consistently do you know take on the load or whatever um but um i'm just conjecturing on that because it was confusing sometimes and it mm -hmm. wasn't uh you know well put together yeah, yeah the, the sense felt a lot the one way through and this goes back to straight to bit one that I'm trying to introduce a concept. I'll give you a scientific reason for it, but the last bit I'm going to fudge because I actually have to, I can't actually explain why this would happen. But once I've established that means it's in the world now, a bit like the anti-aging drugs. I mean, the only time they even talk about it is again as in book four when they reached civilization, which couldn't generate the plant themselves, so they did it synthetically themselves. Mm -hmm. And again, they just kind of go, "Oh, you did it yourselves. You are brilliant at chemistry." You know, that was kind of that was oh. that was kind of what what the uh, you, you should teach us something about that. That's really really good. Like that you <laughs> did that. That well done, everybody. You know, and that's how you were able to have long lives. Yeah, uh, but not as long as me. Like, <laughs> <laughs> For a book that that revels in the amount of science that it throws in page after page paragraph after paragraph it doesn't feel like good science if you know what i mean even though there's equations in there you can do, do all that kind of stuff it doesn't feel it feels more ideas based than actual science based which given the amount of science that he puts in feels like waste space it feels like yeah. this could have been a 200 page book instead of a 600 page book yeah hmm. yeah yeah i mean like you said, though, it was a product of his times as far, as far as it was trying to get it, it was serialized. So mm -hmm. when you when you're serializing something like that, you're trying to just put some it, you're filling a quota and you're yeah. getting mm. getting the stories out there. Um, but like you said, he did have he did have some interesting ideas. Oh, for sure. In yeah. In the book, yeah. you know, and I the one that really stood out to me in the. Uh, Earthman come home the third book was um he has this line here, he says before death had been indefinitely postponed which you know that brings up your uh <laughs> that's one of those throwaway lines about yeah we're immortal yeah. and uh <laughs> uh he says uh it had been thought that memory would turn longevity into a greek gift because not even the human brain could remember a practical infinity of accumulated facts Nowadays, however, nobody bothered to remember many facts. That was what the city fathers and like machines were for. 
they stored data. Living men memorized nothing but processes, throwing out obsolete ones for new ones as invention made it necessary. When they needed facts, they asked the machines. And I was just like, wow, he just wrote about the internet in the 1950s, yeah. you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. And I thought that was that was pretty a pretty brilliant paragraph, you know? And yeah. I was like, oh, wow, that's really cool. And uh, it was because... I think that's so relevant today, yeah. you know, because yep. I even I've had this discussion with my kids saying, you know, because they just like, oh, I'll just look it up. Mm. That's, that's all they ever do is just look it up. And I'm like, well, how are you going to know how to fix something in your house or whatever or in your mm. car or what have you? Oh, I'll just look it up. Mm. Well, what if you can't? Yeah. You know, and then you get the blank stare <laughs> but uh so i, I was kind of interested that he was thinking about that way back then this yep. is like yep. you know over 75 years ago and uh that's uh that was fascinating i thought yeah I, I think there's moments like that throughout the book like right throughout the book like in nearly every chapter or something and like in some ways like one of the reasons I've really enjoyed doing this series so far, I know we're only three books in, is that you get into the habit of let's write that bit down because I think that that's really like a tasty kind of philosophical or technological, you know, advancement or idea to mm -hmm. have back then. But I get sick of doing it in this book because he never really did anything with it beyond the point mm. when he introduces it. And, yeah. and you kind of go, right, I stopped writing them down at that stage and I was like, <laughs> this is frustrating for me, maybe. Mm. And, and, and I can... Say in that case, I'm the problem there because what I wanted out of this book was not this, what the book wanted to do. Yeah. That's not the story that he wanted to tell. So then it's my problem. It's not necessarily the uh, the author's problem, sure. but it meant a lot of those like great ideas, even though the big one is actually the reason that I don't think mm. the book works insofar yeah. as the idea yeah. of the spin dizzy. Yeah. yeah, but Chris, that what you said there though is why the book didn't age well. Because you mm. say it's your problem, but it's not just your problem. It's a lot yeah. of people's problem today that's going to read this book today. Yeah. I have a feeling that many people will have the same exact problem. You know what I mean? And so yeah. is it just your problem? It because it's my problem too. <laughs> you know, and I, yeah. I'm I guarantee it's Fasha's problem. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and, uh, um so you're right, he had these great ideas. And never follow through with them. Yeah. Never delved into them as a story, you know, rather mm. than uh, what we got. <laughs> it, it felt a lot like not. So I think um, the first two that we read, Chris, like you said, yeah. we had an idea and we explored like the entire gambit of consequences from that. Um, here we have a few good ideas like anti-aging and uh, spin disease and like many that are sort of seeded into the story um but we're not really exploring consequences of anything yeah. we're just using them for some what i think the author thinks is an action-packed sequence but it's really just, just dialogue uh that explains everything um yeah, so I, I guess that's what was frustrating for me too, that we didn't explore consequences. But I did wonder, is it really a product of its time or is it a style of storytelling where we just do a bunch of action? Like I, I've seen a lot of movies like this where no one explains mm -hmm. anything. We just have some cool stuff to throw around and then <laughs> things happen. Nobody cares. We all go home. So like, it's is it just like popcorn fiction? Do are, Is there nothing like this? today where you know we don't go into the depths of all the concepts and we just throw a bunch of stuff around to tell a fun story although this wasn't necessarily fun for me but like what could be a fun story to watch mm. or read um that's a good point yeah i i, I mean you said it before we started recording varsha this is this story and you're the same thought as i did so far as I was reading this, going, this is exactly what people say they don't like about classic sci fi. Mm. And so far, that this book uh, and what it tries to do, but I wonder if it's just space opera fiction. And because I don't have a great deal of experience with space opera, mm. where they issue the philosophical discussions for the action, just to pretty much what you're saying, and maybe all space opera, even modern, like Alistair mm. Reynolds, Peter Hamilton, whoever you're going to talk about, 
maybe they all do this insofar as the ideas aren't what they're trying to convey here. Scale, size, scope. Hmm. The bigness of the world is what they're doing. And I think that the book does that. It definitely gives the idea that we're only like a dot at the moment mm -hmm. compared yeah. to what, yeah. what we could be. It definitely yeah. gives off that size of scale. And maybe that's, that's like you say, that's the genre book rather mm -hmm. than the classic sci-fi that, that I've enjoyed reading, which has been the philosophical stuff where they explore yeah. things and ideas and, and, and technological yeah. advances or whatever else it is. And like I say, this book wasn't interested in that other than kind of saying, here's what's happening in the world. This is what we're building this on. If it's smart enough to go like, Having a spin dizzy is one thing, but it doesn't make any sense unless we solve the aging problem. So you've got mm. to have yeah. anti-aging drugs as well. I'm putting the two things together. and it, Okay, there's your premise for going off and doing whatever you, whatever you want. Yeah. With yeah. That stage. So I, I think it is an interesting discussion, especially as we move through these books, to kind of see, is this a style of fiction rather than just kind of a badly executed version of it? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the order in which we are reading the books in this collection also sets us up for that sort of expectation. Because mm -hmm. like you said, Chris, if we had started with the third book, then we'd know what kind of uh, story it is, right? It's just people wandering like from city to city. We're not exploring any specific technological advances or uh, any specific big ideas. We're just doing the big idea <laughs> and moving yeah. on. Uh, in the first book, it felt like like because the first book was the creation of the spin disease and the anti-aging drug that we read it felt like the rest of them would be an exploration of the consequences which it wasn't it hmm. okay in the second book was sort of an exploration and that oh cities were able to fly off of earth cool um but then everything that happened from there on felt silly and like i didn't like the second book very much either but uh, the third book then reading the third book but at least the second book was still something in that ballpark of exploring consequences a little bit but the third book is just like episodic and not at all in line with potentially set expectations that uh we're still going to see what else can happen as a result of this um but in the second book though at least had a character you could relate to yeah yes yeah. because you it brought a character on that had knew nothing yes and so you, as the reader you knew nothing and you would you were learning with him and so mm. that was at least you were immersed in that way at least in that yeah that regard yeah. with amalfi you are not no immersed no at all. not you, at all you cannot yeah. relate to him <laughs> and yeah. uh and so, and like I said, it's episodic, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, Chris, Chris is a, is like a scared young boy, you know, the, the, he, and you get the sense of wonder of the world through him as he's kind of going, Oh mm. God, I'm going down here. I don't know what I'm going to run into or otherwise. And like that carries the second book. It carries you through the second book as, as, as you say, like it's okay. And he's, he's a character that is readable, you know, as mm. opposed to some of the other ones. Yeah. Yeah yeah and the ending of the second book which i hadn't finished for the last discussion it just ended with uh him being given the title of city manager and i'm like that's it that like you you just ended there like that's supposed to mean something to me and then it made more sense when we started yeah. the third book so yeah. i guess they just aren't meant to be read in that order so yeah it makes you wonder why they package it like this yeah because yeah they, you know it's like he definitely wrote the first two books in order to make sense of mm. what he wrote before yeah somewhat you know mm -hmm. uh, because he explained the whole in the first book he explains the origin of how all this came about yeah. and the second book we get a we get a character view and um you know the cities take off and uh so i wonder why they collected it like this yeah in yeah in chronological order rather than publication order yeah yeah publication order yeah <laughs> yeah it and and i think both the beginning uh forward and afterward tell you not to read them in this order i should yeah. have listened oh, do they? <laughs> yeah the afterward busy says start with book two i think is, is yeah. what they suggest yeah. they say start with book two mm. uh, oh, really uh, to be worried. like i i could imagine having read book three and if you like book three and read book one, you would have thought book one was absolutely brilliant. 
because yeah. if you like that world and like the kind of effect that it had set up, book one is clever enough that and it has enough like the relationship stuff with Wagner and, and, and the characters that are there to kind of go, okay, this is this is mm. interesting, this is where it's been set up. I mean, they don't do anything even quite like that again, uh, in yeah. any way. They don't they don't set up even male female dynamics that way or or anything like that. It's just kind of it's kind of again just thrown to the side and said, right, I've explored that mm. bit, we're moving on. Uh, yeah. But I think reading this is one, two, three, four. You can't help but feel like it peters out, or yeah. that it kind yeah. of doesn't. It doesn't have any kind of impetus, kind of towards the end of it because mm -hmm. that, it wasn't even the way that it was written. You know, it was just no done the other way around. And it, the yeah. author does know how to do explanation of consequences or just you know playing out something and twin like because in the first book for instance we saw um there were two things that i thought were done really well uh one was the whole conversation around uh faith and belief uh which they i think i forget the name of the main character but that they explored in some depth i thought that was done really well and then the slow descent into madness of uh the person who's manning the jupiter bridge every day mm -hmm. yeah. i thought that was done really well like because you've taken an idea and then you're figuring out what else could happen because of it so yeah go, you're, you're right going to the third book <laughs> from there feels like you whoa sorry i nearly spilled my coffee uh, going to the third book from there feels like a downgrade for sure yeah uh that, that was interesting because they he did explore religion a little bit more in uh book four mm -hmm. um and i'm the uh the word he used there was a uh a religious order called yes stochasticism that he invented yeah. that he invented um i'm wondering what you think that stood in for chris because you you read it i don't, I don't think Fauci got to it. yeah I, I, I don't know i think it was that kind of a, i mean I kind of link that to, I mean, it's the start of the third book that he kind of talks about the fact that religion has ended as a concept, but that often civilized religions have, have it. And that actually, even though religion was dead as a con concept, 10% of them were really staunch, fervent believers. So there was a fanaticism that carried on through life, whereas 90% were indifferent. So I think he's using that stoicism, whatever it is, to kind of, <laughs> kind of say, look, this is still a civilized society here, or this is still a very... Um, that's what I'm looking for. This is still a very cohesive society that is that is well ordered and has ideas and philosophical yeah. ideas rather than kind of just people scattered to the, the four winds or as what was actually happening is that Earth sort of died out, you know, in some way because yeah. everybody was living for so well, long, there was no no ideas, there was no energy, there was nothing here. But that 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 stock, whatever you call it, was well it's so died out a vibrant society. Yeah, and then it was taken over by that this John guy who's like mm -hmm. head of the warriors of God. Um, and uh, so he, uh, so then now, it, you know, it's like a, almost like a crusading type of uh, Christianity almost. And then yep. you had the, and he was explaining the scholastics to, he was mansplaining the scholastics to <laughs> everybody else. That's and, true. uh, and he says, uh, he says, I, I suspect in actuality that like intellectuals in all times and places, they are large, largely out of touch with the general assumptions of the culture in which they're operating. And um, and I was like, is he comparing stochastics? I think it's stochastics to just stoicism or agnosticism Ooh. or atheism. And I, was I, had, to... I, was, I had actually sort of equated it to Russia, actually, to the kind of because Stoicism is like Paris, right. kind of communism, all of that kind of stuff. That's, right. that's kind of where I went with that. That's, yeah. That could be it too, yeah. Uh, and then, uh, and then, eventually, this John, John, Apostle of God, um, he just uh, he just leaves them a letter and leaves off and says. <laughs> Well, looks like the time's coming to an end. So uh, hopefully, uh, you'll be alone in your your doubt. <laughs> and he, and he's done. <laughs> and, uh, and I wrote a big, I wrote a big 
huh? At the end of that, <laughs> that chapter. <laughs> I'm like, that's it? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I kind of went with uh, Jordan, don't call me John. <laughs> Every right. time I read it, I was like, "Don't, don't you dare call me John!" Don't call me really John. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, uh, that, I mean, again, again, another really good example. Like you create a a foil for a Malfi, and yeah, he's around there good, for a while. A yeah. good foil or somebody that's gonna that's not prepared to buy into his bullshit all the time. And the result, I'll oh, just throw him away, or right, it'll just kind of do nothing with it, you know. Yeah. And the words coming here, it's not as important. It was just mm -hmm. like. Oh, okay. Well, we we really can't do anything about you guys. So, uh, good luck with your doubt, and um, see you in the next universe. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, okay, because yeah. because he, he really built up this guy to be, you know, the a great antagonist. Yeah, you know, he built him up, and then all of a sudden, it was just kind of fizzled out. <laughs> Yeah. And it's all about the next civilization after that. Uh, maybe it was a case of he just, he, his editor said to him, uh, well, we're going to give you another four issues to talk about this, but we're only going to give you one more. Mm -hmm. And he kind of went, right, well, if I'll need to wrap this up in some way or, you know, something like that. You know, you never know what way the publishing of that really played into the storytelling yeah. aspect. Was the Triumph of Time also serialized? I thought just Earth Man Come Home was? Or was... Yeah, I don't know. It it was, um because it it was longer, mm. yeah, and it yeah. was. It is a single story this time instead of being That's a right. bunch of mm -hmm. uh, bunch of episodic ones. So I don't, not sure how uh, how it was originally published. Mm. Yeah, because it was it was a twelve year period, wasn't the whole thing done in? Oh, okay, something like that. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And then and then he wrote. And then he, I guess, he wrote the first two novels as a, as an explanation. Because because well, because the fourth novel ends everything, ends the universe. So, you know, he could only go backwards. Mm. Although it ends the creation, but the last line of the book is, and then creation begun, or something like that. You know, creation begins, something like that. Mm. Yeah. Well, so, yeah, uh, yeah. And is that that kind of cyclical nature of of the world, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. That you ties into begins. the. Uh, to the to the theory that the universe expands and then it contracts. Yeah, contracts. Yeah, yeah. So he had he had a little bit of that in there. Um, yeah. So one more question I had for you guys. Well, I have a few more, but this next question <laughs> is: uh, the first two books uh, felt like they were about something, right? Like the Forever War was really about the Vietnam mm. War. Uh, I am Legend. I don't know specifically what it was but there was something being explored there i right? like the loneliness and isolation of this person so did i mean it's too much to ask of the book as a whole but were there any specific sections or chapters that felt like this is about something else like there is commentary being made here about something uh, more important or bigger than what's on the page well, the fourth book, I think he's definitely exploring the, you know, what if the universe were to end? Like, he's mm. going in that direction. And what is, what would the end of time look like? Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, how how that would come about. Because I think that was a, uh, you know, during the 50s, they were still exploring Einstein's theories and, mm. They were still, you know, and of course, oh, the atomic bomb and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. They were still uh, reeling from the fallout of of that and what happened. And so there was there was a lot of big ideas coming out that had this kind of end of time, end of the world, what have you, end of the universe, uh, and the theory of relativity and all that stuff, and how expansive can that be, and how mm -hmm. far can that take us, and how far can it go. And so I think he had that kind of um, big science question in mind when he wrote, mm. especially The Triumph of Time. I think for the third book, I think he was just writing stuff to throw in a magazine to get, you know, mm. uh, to serialize. Um, and it, maybe the third book is about, uh, like, how would humanity 
go on from Earth into the stars. Um, so that you could look at it that way, mm -hmm. as far as the third book goes. Yeah. yeah, I think I think for me, it's the book is about or the genesis. Of the book is about the fact that the Cold War was going on and the fact mm -hmm. that uh, you know. Yeah. He, I don't think he's seen an end of the Cold War because the two superpowers that would eventually kind of bludgeon each other, other to death, mm. and the point that in that in that event, the only way humanity can grow is off the planet at that stage. Mm. And I, I think if it's about anything, it's about that. But as we've said, like a lot of times, it doesn't really do anything with that. Other yeah. than like, there's a throwaway line about when uh, New York leaves. I just like this. I've made this kind of pity point about this. this is the center of universe being new york you know when it leaves then humanity leaves and the, the mm. russians take over the world then there's like a throwaway line about that and they kind of is right that's okay <laughs> let's let's move on We're, the americans have advanced and the they're still stuck on earth kind of thing but yeah. um but other than that i think then it just becomes like a space opera kind of thing that obviously did well enough for him that people asked him to fill in a backstory and do whatever mm. it became probably a signature is his way to make a living you know i would say in a lot yeah. of a lot of ways you know yeah, that that makes sense. It it does feel like you know to what you said, Chris, about the only way for humanity is to go off the planet. In a lot of cases, it felt like it was the worst of humanity. Like we didn't try to improve or change anything that was bad. Like coming off of series, I loved like Becky chambers um i forget what it's called but the first book is the long way to a small angry planet i loved those books they explored you know what it's like to be kind what alternative societies where people don't have to be horrible to each other and there's not a resource crunch all the time uh they just mm -hmm. do such a wonderful job uh that this feels like obviously yeah this, this feels a bit flat to read in that regard um but yeah, like I, I think uh, the right way to read this to get any enjoyment from it at all is to just go at look at the big ideas and go, wow, oh, you're moving a planet, cool, without thinking about okay, what is that going to do to the people on the planet? <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that I guess, um, yeah, it, it is unsatisfying if you want something out of it <laughs> other than what it does, I yeah. think, yeah, yeah, you could look at it as a cautionary tale too it's like let's let's fix the planet we're on rather than because mm. yeah. the same kind of crap is going to happen up out, out there too mm. yeah uh, <laughs> so you <laughs> yeah. can kind of look at it that way well they, they sort of make that point during the don't they when the i mean they've got this these flying cities and at a certain point they land somewhere and they stay there mm. yeah Right, they, they aren't. They aren't going to move. Right? Yeah. They're, they're, they're going to. They're just going to be resident in a new place. And he, he called it the jungle. I think right. The jungle. That's exactly yeah, right. Yeah. So, and the idea that if there's no change in administration, because Amalfi is in charge of everything for a long time, there's no impetus to go do anything. And even when Amalfi wants to do something else at a certain stage, everybody's like, "Oh, we'll come with." You know, the humanity's stuck. You know, yeah. Democracy, for all of its faults, create, creates this idea that things will always change. You know, it's mm. at some stage there's always opportunity for change. Yeah, I yeah. think that's a good. You know, I think that ties into what you were saying about the um, the uh, the Soviets and the Cold War, yeah. and how it seemed like Blish thought that was going to go on forever, um, and that kind of reflects how, yeah, all, all these cities are in in the jungle. They're doing the same thing that that they were previously like nothing's going to change even though we have the whole universe, universe. to explore yeah yeah because mm. yeah, it was always about it at the start of the book they moved for trade reasons for resource reasons it was always yeah. about that and at a certain point and i think that's the point of the the civilization that has done the anti-aging drugs synthetically is like okay we don't need resources we don't, like that's not a problem anymore we can just sort of do this ourselves and mm. kind of exist just to live forever and do nothing with it you know and, mm -hmm. and, yeah. and i think i found that bit frustrating as well is that okay say i did live for a thousand years uh, and they make the point that amalfi doesn't know an awful lot about anything you know in a lot of ways if you live for a thousand years i think you would mm. yeah well, he doesn't know enough about anything, everything, yeah. but he also does everything. 
Yeah. yeah. So what is everybody else doing? Good, yeah. <laughs> no, why does the what? city manager need to know how to pilot the city? <laughs> why? Yeah. <laughs> like they have yeah, that yeah. realization three quarters of the way into like and yeah. three quarters of the way into the book, but a millennium. <laughs> after they've been flying that the city manager doesn't need to do the flying uh you can have a pilot for that oh hello <laughs> yeah um <laughs> so um Ed, i want to ask a new question Is okay, that okay? Please. okay. Uh, so, <laughs> so um i was reading a short story i think it was william 10 uh, it was told from the point of view of this businessman and the way it plays out is there's a big crisis and then the businessman solves it and there's something about the way he thinks by virtue of being a businessman and therefore only caring about profit that he's able to solve it. When I read that story, I thought it's a commentary on how, you know, like the businessman is <laughs> the most important kind of person in our society and that's the comment that William Tan was making but then I read the author's note afterwards in which he says um, he hated writing that point of view character but he wanted to tell the story he tried it from many different uh, characters points of view but finally the one that stuck was this character whom he hated with all of his being and everything he stood for and so like he felt a bit disappointed and slightly depressed that he had so much in common with someone he hated so much and whose <laughs> ideologies he hated so much so that was a bit eye-opening for me in that like the main character is often not who the author <laughs> himself is rooting for so I was wondering about Amalfi given how insufferable he is do you think you know the author likes this person and he's or it felt like he does but is there room to think otherwise I, yeah i think they could, I, I think he just used him as a as a mm. uh, explanatory piece mm -hmm. I, I don't think the character of Elmalf, amalfi is really that much of a character as mm. as he is more of just a way to spout out all the ideas he had mm. uh and uh so did the author like amalfi mm. uh, I, I think it was irrelevant really <laughs> yeah what what i mean by that is uh yeah i don't mean just like actual like just like i should be more clear uh, i mean like do you actually think that this kind of person is who must rule the world you know like because amalfi does in a certain mm. sense like is this the kind of person you think will do a good job of leading the the world or the planet or the universe into a good place which based on the ending it seems like he does think so um, which yeah well that question is actually brought up in the final okay. chapter oh good okay yeah because they do have arguments with each other mm -hmm. back and forth like about because somehow they knew that they were going to be creating their own universes at the end. Mm. And they had this kind of discussion about, well, I think one guy was like, I wouldn't want to live in your universe, you know? Mm. And so they, <laughs> okay. they had, there was a little bit, like I said, the, there was a little bit more characterization towards the end of the fourth yeah. book where okay. some of the characters actually started becoming characters rather than yeah. just, caricatures i guess <laughs> mm. um yeah yeah and so that that was brought up a little bit um yeah and i and i don't know how to explain it more than that because uh it was you know it's almost too little too late <laughs> mm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but but it was there that final bit like i i've it's the one bit i've tabbed of the entire bloody book to be honest because <laughs> at least it, 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 it provided some finality to it um mm -hmm. it's where malfi says of what use was another universe of this kind he had just seen die mm. it should provided to those and it doomed them at the same moment and then he goes on to explain to each of the rest of them but what would happen if instead he decided to do something different and that's kind of where the the resolution of the book comes from he yep. decides that anarchy is better than more of the same mm. in some ways and i mean i don't think it's a side of amalfi we've seen it it, it wasn't 
brought forward at any stage but i think as as a construct and idea it's it's an interesting one insofar as what is the point of just hitting the reset button to do exactly the same thing again mm -hmm. is it right. not more interesting to exist and create with a different stimulus so rather than kind of as kind of the the forward might have suggested it was about him and putting himself into the future it was more about well what if i just do the thing that you're not supposed to do uh mm. which at, at least does tie into the fact that he was bored and that everybody at the end of time was very bored there was yeah. no impetus in life everybody was just thought this this existence sucks let's rip it up and do something mm. again yeah yeah and uh, yeah because he brought up the question what is it going to be like and he said that's unknowable yeah. and the unknowable is what he wanted once yeah yeah but the thing is, as a actually, you know, in some ways, is interesting enough that it sort of made a lot of the rest of it. I think you said this pretty much in your review, yeah, Jared. In so far as like that idea is a blockbuster idea, you know, I yeah. I think it's a big idea. It's something that that it feels like it's been worth exploring. Whether this book did it or not, it kind of raises big questions, which is what classic sci-fi is supposed to do. Mm. And yeah. why this is probably in the sci-fi masterwork series because of that ending. Those those, those last three paragraphs. Yeah, <laughs> it, like it's like the book was trying to redeem itself. And, uh, <laughs> give, give you a half uh, decent page at the ending there to yeah, to kind of wrap stuff up in a better way. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 You're never finishing this book for so I'm just uh, I'm, I, I, feel, I feel very confident in, the, in, the, in that <laughs> before the end of the year, challenge accepted. <laughs> <laughs> so the only kind of books that I really DNF are if I don't like the if I don't like where the author's coming from, like if I fundamentally disagree with their ideas like i think ayn rand comes to mind i dnf'd her book and mm. that's pretty much it so i will finish this eventually <laughs> um yeah uh, well, Jared, yeah go ahead a question that came up uh among some of our um page chewing peers uh is why is this a masterwork yes mm -hmm. so why do you think it's a masterwork I think just the big ideas, I because I feel like the Forever War, it does explore some very scientific concepts in a very nice way. But, um, and the second book wasn't that scientific. There was some like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, rigor in science written up, which I didn't buy, but it was there. Um, similarly, this one had that, Bit of like slightly rigorous science, but also a lot of big ideas. And I, I based on this book, I'm now coming to believe it's not the writing style or the immense character work or anything that, that would have a book put in the masterworks. I thought I thought the selection would be more well rounded in that regard, like choosing a book for all of its merits, not just the big scientific ideas. But now I'm coming to think that this one's probably just there for the interesting science-ish ideas. Hmm. What do you think, Chris? So I don't think when we started this journey, or this 15-year friendship that we keep on joking about, <laughs> uh, I think we would all accept that we expected not all of these books to be loved and liked. I think that's part of the reason that this is an interesting journey insofar mm -hmm. as explore what makes classic sci-fi classic sci-fi and what do we not like about it. And I think for all three of us, maybe I'm being unkind, but I don't think any of the three of us would consider ourselves experts in the field. And that's what makes it interesting, if you know what I mean. That, that's what makes yeah. part of the journey forward. So as you say, we have had three very different books so far. We basically had a, a, what I think is a classic sci-fi book that I loved at the start more than, say, certainly some others. The second one, you're right, is a dystopia book. Like, it's mm -hmm. not so much a science fiction space book in any way. And this one is a big ideas space opera mm -hmm. that the other two the other two were not. You know, that kind of mm -hmm. idea of an overlong book about things but with some ideas rather than about ideas. And the next book that you kind of come up against is another type of book altogether. Mm -hmm. It's very philosophical sci-fi, right? Yeah. 
so I think it's this spread of, of types of books that you that you get. And I think we are going to hit ones every so often that we might be able to smell what they're like, even from the title, from the author, from that kind of stuff from far mm -hmm. away and kind of say, this is going to be probably one of these types of books. Mm -hmm. And we'd probably have to come to some sort of agreement to say, you know, it's okay to DNF some of these because I'd yeah. be surprised if we actually make it. Yeah. all of them if we have a hard and fast rule about trying to get through but i will say jared gets the absolute gold star for reader of the month this <laughs> month for oh. finishing this book cover to cover because this was a challenging read it was. for me second it was. time over it was challenging i um uh, but um but i'm not i'm not um i'm glad that i did read it yeah though. it's not uh you know because i i liked um i don't know i, I like I like to break stuff down and analyze it and, and and look at it no matter no matter whether the merits are yeah. um something that i'm looking for or not i mean because yeah and you have a discussion like this and that's what makes it palatable because you you want to um you want to find out what works and what doesn't and you know for for you and for you know for if anybody else wants to know and uh so that's that's part of the pleasure of it um yeah. And as far as this being a masterwork, um, it's not that uh, it's not that Blish couldn't write. He yeah. he's, he can sure. write. You know, there were actually there were actually a few times where stuff, some description, some descriptors were kind of poetic. Yeah. You know, and so he had talent. This that's that's not debatable. I think in in uh in his writing it's just i just think it's just uh um you know we're not used to this style and um and he was not trying to make good characters uh at all he wasn't trying to do that and so uh but he could be poetic you know it, especially when he describes that 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 glass of wine or whatever it was in that last chapter i thought that was a beautiful passage right there and i i liked how he uh described that you know he had to he even mentioned the meniscus of the of the uh the wine in the glass and i was like oh <laughs> that's a scientific term put in a beautiful poetry you know and so um so and i think he probably had the respect of a lot of his peers at the time that these were published and he probably had um and so i think some people have read some, this and taken some inspiration from it to create other stuff and that's why i think it's in the masterworks collection yeah. mm. uh, influential plus you've also got to remember he wasn't writing a book for the sf masterworks collection he was writing a book yeah. for his audience that was reading it at the time you yeah, know sure. and, and, and obviously it was doing a good enough job for him to be considered yeah or maybe even for in that way yeah yeah maybe even for an extra paycheck you know yeah <laughs> it's mm. uh yeah yeah so. that makes sense but 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 like you jared like i was really looking forward to the discussion even though i i really don't like the book very much at mm. all but i still think that's what makes it a really interesting discussion because exploring what doesn't work about and uh, why or what i wanted from the book and exploring my own feelings about that is where the whole process and the whole interest in this comes from yeah yeah that I, I agree. I like, I mean, I think <laughs> one of the things that I've been trying to do recently is uh, try to learn to write. And it's important to see things that I don't like and yeah. analyze why I don't like them. So yeah. I can take that learning. So I, 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 I agree that it has merit just um, from that perspective. But also, like, it's not entirely bad. I did no. like i don't know 90 ish percent of the first two books i think where they both fudged it up for me was in the end <laughs> like the ending was too rushed this one i didn't like amalfi and the whole thing was from amalfi's perspective so just didn't work for me um like i i, I found i thought i did but i i literally <laughs> wrote down something in like angry <laughs> gaps at some point <laughs> like why yeah. won't you communicate uh but there was um <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i think just for the ideas I, there was still i i was talking about um 
I, I was considering uh, doing the thing that you said, Jared, which was to stop the book three and go to book four before I maybe try and come back. But then at the point I was in in book three, I had some interesting ideas occasionally that like there was sorry what uh what what i'm trying to say is that like i became interested again so it was like a graph each time like oh that's a cool idea and then like fail in the execution oh that's a cool idea like oh, okay i'm angry about these things that you did instead but yeah if if you're the kind of reader who has patience for that sort of thing then i think yeah it, because we had a deadline, I didn't finish this, but I, I don't intend to DNF it. I do, I will finish it, and I'm I'm sure I'll take away things that I like from it. So yeah. Um, I did have one question about uh there was one reason that made me think this wasn't a well-written book, but I want second and third opinions on that. Is I didn't get a sense of the amount of time that passed. <laughs> very well it felt like i was constantly jarred by what they said happened in the time that they were in it felt like just a few days passed each time when in fact really what happened in between was several decades and uh did did you feel like you got a better sense of that than i did or what was it just how it was written i i went looking at reviews of this afterwards that is a very common criticism of this book okay. in fact mm -hmm. They, a lot of people have pointed out that it actually is inconsistent. Uh, what mm. some of the events that happen actually don't make numerical sense or out of order, etc. So the proofreading of the book maybe is not, and um, probably because it was serialized in the way that it was, mm -hmm. um, is not consistent. That seems to be a common common thread of it. There, like for a thing that happens over millennia, you do mm. not get a that the sequence mm -hmm. of time yeah. kind of in the way that you would like in an art of sense. I'm sure if you pull it apart, and it is put there in a couple of places of this happened at that day kind of thing then then it might help uh because like amalfi does live to be to live a millennia but we don't actually get the sense that he is he has lived a millennia if you know mm. what i mean he is the same character in book two as he is yeah. in book four in a lot of stages you know there's no growth mm. there. yeah 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 i think i uh, i think in my review i called it a chaotic mess <laughs> and, uh, you're right because oh it's, yeah it, the, the inconsistency is there it's uh you don't get a good sense of how much time is passing in between a, each episode. Um, and, you know, I think I, by the end of book four, he's 2,000 years old, possibly. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's it? Yeah, that's it. The end it. of the universe then, happened a 1,000 years from... That's all we got left, Vasha. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily for you, <laughs> you're not going to make it. <laughs> Unless you make, uh, you know, one of those drugs. That keep you, amazing, but... you look Wait, like you're did... like you're disappointed, but like you're not mine. <laughs> no, I, I, that, I'm disappointed because that feels silly. Like, at what point did we start estimating the age of the universe to be several billion years? Yeah, and like yeah. we just like was it not in the 50s? Did it happen after that? Like, how, how it, like it seems silly I mean, to say it's going to end in a thousand years from now when the time scale that we always talk about is millions or billions of years. Yeah, I, th <laughs> I think it was closer to because um, Amalfi was as over 2000 years old, but I think it's almost 4000 years since the beginning of the bridge or whatever the uh mm. 19 okay. oh yes 60 or whatever. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. uh but even so it's it's still a ridiculously short uh, amount of time <laughs> uh, uh, but it also it also because of what we know about the universe it doesn't make sense either do you know what i mean the, how they explain the end of the world and the end of time etc you know and time scales we think the universe is probably you know that this the theory that the book works off is if it's very solid and present theory insofar as the big bang expands and it starts to contract but if yeah. anything we're just past the midpoint mm. <laughs> uh, yeah. of, of where we are in time but these, this is modern science and, and what we mm. kind of suspect and know at, at this okay. time so uh, okay can't blame bliss for that maybe yeah so that was the other reason why i was excited for triumph of time because i thought we're looking at the city being alive for millions or billions of years and as like, amalfi is mayor for all that time no thank you but <laughs> thousand more years <laughs> i can handle <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> yeah i gotta go read that book <laughs> i will finish it chris and i will send you a note when i do 
You do. I don't judge you for a second, Farsha, but I just feel if you listen to your heart, the only reason that you will be finishing it is to send me the picture. Just, yeah, I told you so. <laughs> and if that's the reason you're going to put yourself through it, then so be it. But I'm just giving you permission already to say, look, don't do it to yourself. Don't do it. Do yeah. your reread of Malazan instead. Fair. <laughs> Very fair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to think, was there anything else to discuss? Um, you said you had a lot to say about the final chapter, Jared. I know we talked about it in bits and pieces, but was there anything we missed? No, I think we went over it pretty. I mean, the final chapter is only six pages, and uh, okay. um, Chris brought it up the uh, the final two paragraphs there or whatever, and uh, that was that was part of it, and um, and also I just thought uh, and them arguing about you know the uh the universe you know who was going to create which universe or whatever <laughs> but um and 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 a very nice poetic finish i thought uh mm. that um yeah. kind of <laughs> made the book a little better than what it was mm. at least yeah. Uh, yeah but that was it yeah the only other thing i'm sad about is that none of us there wasn't even one of us that that kind of really en really enjoyed it do you know what i mean that that would have been yeah. nice because i would like to actually hear from somebody who really mm. did enjoy the book you know exactly what it was about the book that they really grappled on to mm. uh, i suspect i know but but it would be nice to hear them somebody explain yeah. that uh, the, that the first book until the last chapter i'm probably <laughs> there yeah um but, yeah yeah i enjoyed the first book mm -hmm. up so until you know, it it had minor problems, but it, it wasn't. Uh, yeah, it wasn't like the third one. The third one, I, it's just. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think I suppose that also shows the evolution of Blish as a writer. I suppose I, I guess it's a factor of both the fact that this was serialized and the novels were not, and um, and also maybe he improved as a writer. That uh, I think the first book was third in publication order, if I remember correctly. So three one four two, I believe it goes. Uh, three one four two. I believe. Okay. Which is uh, your mm. yeah uh, pie order, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The three one four two. It was yeah yeah. Three, one, mm. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, I did like the first one a lot, and I, I haven't read the fourth book yet, but I feel like the scope do like it if it wasn't more. Amalfi, but I'm gonna reserve judgment on that until I yeah. actually finish it. I believe I believe Case of Conscience is also in the SF Masterworks. I do have it. It's a much shorter book. I'm actually quite interested to read it. Yeah. Given that I, I like to see it read a shorter Blish book, you know, the self-contained because I, like 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 you, Jared, I I think the man can write. I think some of his prose in some places is actually excellent. Mm. You know, so I think uh, in a shorter form and a self-contained novel that he's went ahead and written. I, I'm yeah. quite interested in, in, in that idea. I am also eager for that book because I think it addresses questions of religion and some philosophy there, which I thought he did a good job with in the first book. So, yeah. yeah. For sure. <clears throat> cool. How far down the line is that one? I think a few years. <laughs> okay. 2037. <laughs> uh... <laughs> uh, I had to get I, my uh, anti-aging drug. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, maybe we all make it. It's the good news is it's just an antibiotic. <laughs> right. Oh man. Um, I think the next one is Do Android Stream of Electric Sheep, right? Yes, it is. Cool. Okay. I've I've read that one. I liked it, and there's a lot to I have read it. that one too. Cool. Have you read it, Jared? I have read uh the comic book form. Ah. Uh, oh, which which was painted and it was in large format and it basically just took the text right off the book and, and <laughs> put it on a page and put it with a picture oh, okay so i pretty much read the book <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> oh, okay. that, that, that will be interesting to hmm. hear actually Jared, because i think this is um i think to have stream of lectureship is an extremely extremely literary book Mm. I think Dick is an extremely yeah. literary writer. 
Yeah. And yeah. actually an awful lot of the ideas are very much in the words that he uses and describes. So actually seeing whether that translates and you get something new out of it would be one of the things I'd be yeah. most interested to hear. Uh, that's a yeah. long time ago, so I'll try my best. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, book 30, by the way, is Kiss of Conscience, so we're not actually too far down the line. Okay, no. just a couple of years. <laughs> just a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> what was I thinking? Two yeah, attacks uh, and three marriages later. There we go. <laughs> 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 oh, um, yeah, I think I think Philip K. Dick is one of those writers who explores like the whole sphere of the idea, like all the consequences of what he says. I'm, I'm really looking forward to when we talk about Ubik. I think that one's also not far off. So, yeah, cool. cool. All right. For <laughs> anybody who's still with us, uh, we are going to read Two Androids, Dream of Electric Sheep, next month. Uh, we don't have the dates yet, but it'll be probably late November ish that we discuss the book. Um, We'll see everyone then if you're joining us. If you'd like to join us on these discussions or uh, just on the forum, chat with us about these books or any others, consider joining the Faith Chewing Forum. Um, I'll have Jared and Chris do outros. Chris, do you want to start us off this time? <laughs> I start us. My name is Chris Mullins, sometimes YouTuber, sometimes appear <clears throat> on other people's channels talking about cool stuff like <laughs> this uh, or on the Faith Chewing Forums uh, with the, yourself and Jared. Jared, you're up. I am Jared. I am on the Fantasy Thinker YouTube channel, and I'm on the page chewing forums as well. And you can catch my mostly weekly blog, uh, Creative Crossroads, on pagechewing.com. Nice. Yeah, those are a lot of fun. Lot of fun to read. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. We'll see everyone a month from now. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.